Welcome back to another great episode of Cascading Leadership. I am your host, and I'm going to shorten up this title because LB gives me so much grief. <laughs> I am just plain old Dr. Jim. And with me, I have my co-host. I am Lawrence Brown, otherwise known as LB. Yeah, that was brief. You, you, you mocking me already? I don't like where this show is going. It'll be a good one. Yeah, it will be a good one. I'm pretty excited to have our, our featured guest back. For those of us that joined us in the previous episode, we were setting the stage for a sales effectiveness masterclass, and we're, we're walking through an end-to-end -end approach on not only selecting top sales talent, but developing them and then doing some of the blocking and tackling that's necessary to build elite teams. And that's part of the reason why we had Carrie on the show. But I want to hit rewind real quick and set a little bit of context. So Carrie, I want you to go back into the not so way back machine and tell us a little bit about some of the accomplishments that you had knocked down as an individual contributor. Okay. So I've always worked in the scientific community in capital equipment sales, as well as sort of renewable sales. And starting way back at the beginning of my career, I would have quotas that were a million-ish dollars on a deal size that was anywhere from 10 to $60,000, but that was 25 years ago. Over the course of my career, I've had deals that were upwards of a million dollars that were pretty complex enterprise software sales. And quotas anywhere from a million dollars as an individual contributor to $125 million when I was responsible for the consumables business at a major analytical chemistry company. So it runs the gamut. If you had to ballpark the amount of revenue that you had generated for your organizations as an individual contributor, where do you think that ballpark number would land? I would have to say 50 million plus. I'm looking at the I'm looking at my wall of recognition over here that my daughter put up for me the other day because I left it all in a box. I would say my best year was six million dollars as an individual contributor. Again, with that sort of 50 to 100 thousand dollar price point. When people ask me what I'm most proud of. The year that I had my middle daughter, I was pregnant or on maternity leave for six months of the year, and I was the number one sales rep in the world. That's awesome. So I want to spin that forward. So that was your individual con contributor track record. Now let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about your team experience. When you were leading, building, and developing teams, what were, you said that you had teams that had combined quota upwards of a hundred million or something like that. If, uh, if I remember correctly, give me a sense for what that team experience looked like and what those quotas looked like and what you were able to drive as a leader of a team. So when I was the director of the consumables business at the scientific company I was referring to earlier, the national, I was the director of North America. It was a highly matrixed organization. And so I had some of the team that were, that reported to me directly. Some of the marketing team reported to me directly. And then there were field sales reps that were more dotted line kind of scenarios. And those teams, that was more of a consumables business kind of scenario. And they would also have four to $8 million territories. And we used to joke that the deal size in that space, we did $125 million, $1,500 at a time. If you divided the number of transactions by the dollar, it was $125 million, $1,500 at a time. Wow, that is that is a high volume of deals. So when you encapsulate your career to this point as a sales leader, how much revenue do you would you ballpark your teams have driven to the organizations that you, uh, you supported? Oh, it would be hundreds of millions, but I haven't really stopped and done the math. It's been capital teams that had on balance 16 million up to the consumables team that was 125 million since 2009 was when I started in sales leadership. That's a great bit of context. And then one last element on the team conversations. When throughout your career as a sales leader, how many people on your teams in you know, ballpark again have qualified for president's clubs, national awards, that sort of stuff, that sort of stuff? Give us a sense of that. So a fair number. So the one year we had, a, as a team, had a really amazing year. And I think I had eight people on my team. And of the eight people, three of them were in the top 10. And were, so t the top top 10 individual contributors were President's Club. That was fun. Really just, I, I don't know, quite a few. 
quite a few. And would it be safe to say that as a sales leader, you have, you know, let's say 10, 15 years in, in that sales leadership position, would it be safe to say you have, you've had at least one person qualify for president's club each of those years? I don't know that it would be fair to do that because it would depend on which team I was working with when it was just me and individual contributors, then yes. But when it was more director level, then everybody was on my team and the Got entirety it. of president's club was on my team. The main reason why I wanted to go through that is to communicate to the audience that this is not some low level schlub that's talking all theoretical. This is somebody that's had a track record of not only producing at the individual contributor level, but also at the team level and building elite teams. So this is just not some superficial theoretical conversation that we're having. We actually have somebody who is a heavy hitter and a highly technical sales process coming in and talking about that. I always feel, I always feel uncomfortable talking about achievements. Yeah. I kind of caught that, right? It's it, you don't want to sound like you're actually uh, bragging, but that piece about being on maternity leave for, for six months and being number one, that's like straight flexing. And that's pretty awesome. Yeah. I, I did have one, I did have one kind of a Philip, more of a philosophical question because I'm on geek about education and all that. How did you handle the actual transition from individual contributor? Because I hear this quite a bit of, from sales leaders early in their careers is how did you address or how did you feel about or how did you attack going from an individual contributor to a sales leader? You know what, the, when I moved from being an individual contributor to a sales leader, I was, I knew I was good at selling. I know that you did a, a review of some of Malcolm Gladwell's stuff. Yes. That the book Outliers, that's yes. the whole theory of 10,000 hours. I, I hit 10,000 hours. I, I actually went back and did the math after I read that book. And I went, oh, that makes so much sense because I really felt like I had mastered selling, that anything more that I did in selling was going to be tweaking and that it was time to do something different because it was very quickly getting a, not challenging, right? So I knew I had a really robust background, right? And that I like to coach. I'd always like to coach. And so when a leadership position to open within my company, I applied for it. And the team that I took over was actually the team that I had been on. And everyone on the team was older than me and more senior. And I approached it with humility. I, when I screwed up, it, it was, I screwed up. I always learned, you learn best from your screw ups. It was when I tried to tell somebody who had been selling longer than me, how to sell. And it, unsurprisingly, he was pretty upset about that. But humility, quite frankly, that I am new to this space that I'm good at sales, but this is not sales anymore. This is managing people. And I'd not done that before. And not only was I managing people, these weren't athletes. These weren't people that were, you know, these were people whose lives I could affect. And you start thinking about, okay, this individual is an underperformer and I have some choices here. And if I make a bad choice, I'm talking about someone's livelihood. I'm talking about their ability to feed their family. And so I approached sales leadership as a new leader with humility. Awesome. Thank you. In our last episode, we spent quite a bit of time talking about hiring strategy in general and some of the tactics that you used in your highly specialized and technical world. I want to bring that up a level. Let's just assume that whoever is in a hiring position within sales is are looking for profiles that align with the requirements of the job. So whatever those requirements are, a candidate is close enough to warrant a conversation. Now, when you're having the conversation, what are the things that you believe are the best practices or core competencies required for sales success that you interview for versus uh, beyond just what's on paper and what they've produced in previous roles? A couple of things. First of all, because our sales are very technical, I'm not looking for someone who can, we call it show up and throw up. I'm not looking for someone who can vomit specs or who can talk about the science all day long. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in people who can connect the dots, who can ask a series of questions of customers that will relate the technical specifications and the value of the product to the everyday workflow of the customer, right? You can have an instrument that is 
the fastest and the most sensitive and the best at whatever it does. And it will absolutely not fit in a given laboratory. And the better salesperson is going to figure out that they're maybe less sensitive, less fast instrument will work better in that laboratory because of whatever their workflow is. And so I'm looking for someone who can connect the dots. And so you're looking for someone who's curious. You're looking for someone who asks a lot of questions. In the first interview, when I say, and what are your questions for me? If they don't have four or five, I'm done. Oh no, I'm good. That is, you're, we're done. The other thing I'm looking for is long-term thinking. What do you think is the most important thing about sales? And when people talk about building business and building long-term relationships, as opposed to getting the most revenue as fast as I hum- as humanly possible or driving revenue, we, yeah, that's sales, right? But how do you do that? So I'm looking for people that are focused on building relationships, building business, building long-term strength. And more senior reps will know figuring out with younger people is tougher or people who are earlier in their sales career because they don't, they may not have had that experience. So with them, oftentimes what I'm listening for are the times that they've struck and then persevered. Tell me about a time where things didn't go your way and what did you do? And so I'm looking for that resilience. I had a candidate the other day who's earlier in his career. And he said, I was taking a class and it was really hard. So I dropped it. Okay. Maybe not the right answer. So yeah. So we're just, I'm looking for, I'm looking for grit. I'm looking for resilience. I'm looking for tenacity. I'm looking for times when they've had difficult times and pushed through it. I'm looking for critical thinking, those kinds of things. One thing that you mentioned in there provides a great segue into the rest of our conversation. We're going to focus this conversation in the area, in the area of customer centric selling and also navigating that complex deal cycle and stakeholder landscape and shepherding a deal along. You said that you're trying to identify people that have a relationship first focus and I'm paraphrasing long-term thinking as one of the key criteria for sales success. So how does that capability or that competency tie into customer centric selling? So Customer centric, it's um, relationship based selling is important, but you cannot always have a good relationship with customers. You are going to run across customers that you just flat out don't like. I have joked that I would sell a chromatographic instrument to the devil himself if he had 50 grand. And you can edit that out if you want. I don't care, but I got to feed my kids. At any rate, customer centric actually puts the relationship slightly as number two a little bit in the sense that it doesn't matter if you like the customer, it doesn't matter if you're going to have a long-term relationship with the customer. Your goal is to look at the requirements of the customer, the needs of the customer very broadly, right? Not just the individual that you're dealing with, but the environment that you are trying to provide a solution for, because you never have one customer. You have the person that called you or the person that sent you the email and then all of the people around them. The person that called you might be the person that's going to be using the instrument, but the person that's going to make the decision is two levels above that individual. You may be talking to an entire laboratory full of technical folks that know how they need the software to work, for example. But if you don't involve the IT person, you're done. They can walk in at the 11th hour after you've been working for six months or a year on a million dollar project and go, this is not going to work in our IT infrastructure. This is a complete waste of time. So there are the customer is a, it's not an individual. It's them plus the entire organization that surrounds them that has the ability to influence their decision. So being customer centric is not just a relationship. It is being focused on everything that goes around that. You can have a great relationship with an individual and still lose. That's absolutely, uh, absolutely true. I think the other thing that, that Carrie, that you touch on is, and we had talked about this a little bit earlier, and I think even in the past episode is about the stakeholders. So as I was listening to what you were saying, that whole ecosystem, right? Because to your point, and I've actually 
seen this on a couple of occasions, and I was chuckling about the that tech at the end that no one bothered to engage all of the necessary stakeholders, and then the deal actually fell flat. And having seen that experience again, I was chuckling about it. My question is that as you think about you're, you're talking about stakeholders with relationship to the to your client, right, and the client being much larger than just an individual. Talk about the actual stakeholders that are in the full system that will help drive what your engagement plan will be towards the end user? That's a great question. And in our space, and I would imagine in other spaces, you can be contacted by individuals in just about any part of the organization. So you might be contacted as a salesperson by a purchasing agent. You might be contacted by the IT person who has been tasked to be the project manager for a complex enterprise software sale because they know they need an upgrade or improvement or some kind of compliance that they don't currently have. But the people that are going to use the software are certainly not the IT people. They are individuals in the laboratory. They're managers of compliance. They're people in quality. And so you have generally, you have end users, you have what we would call influencers, have technical buyers, and you would put IT in that technical buyer. You have, of course, economic buyers. So the people that have the ability to sign off on. And depending on the company you're working with, that sign off could be $5,000, it could be $10,000, it could be a million dollars. But you can have sales that can be signed off on by a contributor. You can have sales that have to be signed off on by the CEO. And by the way, the CEO is in Switzerland. So it can be a pretty broad range. And so what you have to do, but again, going back to customer-centric selling, is at the very, very beginning, oh, this is a million-dollar sale. This is not a $10,000 sale. So the chances that this decision is going to be made where you're sitting is pretty slim. So again, that critical thinking. When this person says to me, well, I get to decide, is that really true? Who are you talking to? What's their title? So now you got to get good at how do you dig into who's actually going to make the decision? And so now you're starting to talk about questions. So talking about a pretty important piece of equipment, it's going to go into a deployment that includes lots of regulation. Who's the quality person that's going to be involved in this? Who's the regulatory that's going to be involved in this? Who's the metrology folks that are going to be responsible for fixing this? This is a really big, we have a saying in sales that if you're going to lose, don't lose alone, right? So if you're going to decide on something, don't decide alone because it works both ways. And so really what comes into it is now your questioning skills. And at the very beginning, setting the stage for, I know this is going to take six months. I know there are going to be 30 people involved. Let's start talking about those folks today. And what our next steps are to make sure that we help all of those people be comfortable with your decision, because you told me you were going to decide that's awesome, but there's probably other people that have to be comfortable with your decision. So let's talk about that. Carrie, it sounds like that's also transferable too, because what you're talking about is not necessarily focusing on the economic buyer only, which means that in any sales transaction right you want to make sure that you're adhering to that methodology that you have just taken us through just tying in the what you were saying about the economic buyer not being the only person as the focal point economic buyer is rarely the decision maker in our world so i want to throw out a scenario and this is something that anybody that's in sales leadership has dealt with at some point early in our career We've been conditioned to say, hey, you only want to deal with the decision maker. And if you're not dealing with that person, you're just wasting your time. Why is that just complete? Well, I, my opinion, why is that thinking just complete BS when it comes to a complex sale? Because there's always someone above that decision maker that can blow it up. And they can blow it up for a variety of reasons that has nothing to do with the capability of the individual that is making, that is supposedly making the decision, right? So oftentimes if, so for example, let's say you have a customer that's trying to decide to purchase a widget. It's a really expensive widget. It's a $400,000 widget and they are the decision maker. 
the technical decision maker, right? And you speak to them and you say, okay, so who, I'd like to speak with whomever, these decisions never get made by one person, who else is involved? And you find out who the users are and you get the feeling that they all like the guy that's, or the woman that's making the decision and the manager is going to have to sign off on it. Okay, great. Or the director is going to have to sign off on it. Can I meet him? Yep. The director says to you straight to your face, I will do what Sarah recommends. I will sign off on whatever Sarah recommends. So Sarah recommends your widget and true to word, the director signs off on Sarah's widget. And then it goes to the VP of quality or the VP of R and D or the VP of finance. And that individual says, I've never seen this company before. I don't know who they are. I know this other company that you also looked at. They're about the same price. You will buy them because I know them. Someone can always blow it up. IT can blow it up. Quality can blow it up. That is using. So you may have the decision-making ability at your site, but there may be another site that has 50 of another company's widget. And they may come in and go, why are you buying this widget? We already have 50 of these other ones. And so a complex sale, typically when you're, it's, I would say that 10% of the time you're dealing with one site with one group of decision makers that has no influence on them from somewhere else. It's pretty rare. You also just described like even in a, uh, in a peer process right across the board, it could be someone else that has the potential to blow it up, right? Once it goes to another department. So when you think about, when you think about that, what would be your suggestions on establishing a effective mapping process for for the stakeholder landscape you should know the company that you're dealing with and you should know who your competition is right and you should know what other sites might also be doing the same thing that the site is that you're working with and if you know that another site is doing what this site is doing it behooves you to ask the question are they doing this process at other facilities yes they are which vendors are they doing? Are they using there? It is your responsibility as a salesperson to figure that out. And so part of it is learning about the company that you're talking to. Is this a small company? Is it a big company? Are they held by another company? Who are the, if this is a really high dollar sale, who are the people that are potentially in the decision-making process? That stuff's typically public. It's typically on a website, the VP of R&D. Where did they work? If you are going to have a really high dollar sale, it is your job to vet that stuff out. I'm going to interject here because there are so many great takeaways that we've just gone through in a very short amount of time. I think the bumper sticker version of what you're talking about is it's the responsibility of the rep to have a decent level understanding of the political landscape, the economic landscape, the competitive landscape, and the decision-making process in order to fully understand what they're dealing with. That's why it's complete BS to just deal with the economic buyer and only the economic buyer, because there are so many different elements that you described, Carrie, that can just blow stuff up. One of the things that we as sales leaders often hear, especially with people that are in complex sales, is that, hey, I'm struggling with moving from this person that I'm talking to and getting in front of all these other people that are involved in the decision-making process. I know that the decision isn't made at this level, but how can I get this person to either intro me or... What are some ways that I can go and get in front of these other people without burning the relationship that I have in front of me? What are your thoughts on that? There's a couple ways to do it. And I can speak to how I have done it. I have speak to, I can speak to how I've seen it done in this space. My feeling is that it's probably fairly similar in other spaces. When you need to speak with people two over and three over. My, my experience has always been to say, I understand that you are going to make the technical decision on this instrument, that you are well-regarded in the organization, that they believe that you are the scientist or the technical person that understands this process the best. I, I want to beg your forgiveness in advance, but I have been part of big complex sales like this for highly technical things where someone came from left field at the 11th hour and messed things up. 
And I want to make sure that doesn't happen to you as much as I don't want it to happen to me. And 98% of the time, we connect with that individual and they look us in the face and they go, I'm going to do what Sarah says. Great. We're done. And if they go for that, all right, great. We have the introduction to the person, whomever that is or whomever they are. And we have that conversation. And again, 98% of the time they go, we're going to sign off on what Sarah says. So they just admitted to you that they're going to sign off on what Sarah says. So if they come back at the 11th hour and say, we're going to buy somebody else, that's a problem. But you also have the opportunity to say, hey, have you used this equipment previously in your life? Do you have, do you have any questions about us and about our technology and how it differs from the stuff that you've used previously in your career? And it's a five minute conversation. You can also use your own leadership to get in the door. You, if you know there's going to be a VP involved, then hopefully on your side of things, you have a VP that's willing to pick up the phone and introduce themselves. You get the name of the VP, you ask the person like, hey, our vice president of sales is really interested in meeting your vice president. VPs talk to VPs. Again, humility, a little self-deprecation goes a long way. And if they agree, yep, let them talk to each other. Fabulous. VPs talk to VPs. If you want to talk to the director of R&D, you have an excuse for your director to be around. My director's going to be in town. He'd really like to meet some of the leadership here and just understand how everybody does the business. So uh, appealing at a higher level is very important. You can also appeal to the committee, right? So If you're going to do a presentation and nine times out of 10, you're going to do a pretty technical presentation. You have a group. I'm going to bring in a group of people to do a presentation. Let's make sure that we have all the right people on your group. I'm going to bring in my technical folks. Let's make sure we have your technical folks here. You know, it's incredibly important to IT for them to be here. It's incredibly important for metrology to be here. This is going to be a significant change in the way you do business. Let me help you engage your stakeholders So everyone is comfortable. So always appealing to making them look good. I know that LB's got to, got to chime in with a couple of follow-ups in that area. That is a great map. I think one thing that I'm curious about, and this might not be something that's as big of a practice in your space, but there's a concept of personal professional brand and leveraging that to advance the conversation. What are your beliefs? or positions on leveraging that to move forward. Absolutely. So in my space, and actually in a lot of technical spaces, the more technical your space, the smaller the world, right? If you work in oil and gas, chemical engineering, those chemical engineers know each other. They either went to school together, they're in societies together, they go to meetings together. It's a little bitty world. It's the same thing in my world. We play a game, actually. It's called Six Degrees of Harold McNair. There is a guy at Virginia Tech, and he actually just passed away last year, two years ago. His name is Harold McNair. He is one of the key thought leaders in in analytical chemistry. And the joke is, how many degrees of Harold McNair are you? It's just everybody knows everybody, right? So if you are a salesperson in this space, and you do not have an incredible amount of integrity such that customers trust you, you're done. You are not gonna work in this space, you're not. Or you're gonna work in individual contributor roles for companies that nobody else wants to work for. Integrity and personal brand is everything in this space. And it is the number one piece of advice that I give to new salespeople in this space. Be careful what you say and who you say it to, and never ever push the sale over the solution, or it will bite you in the butt tomorrow and next year and the year after that. Never push the sale harder than the solution. That That's gold right there. That should be the title of this, this episode. The emotional intelligence element is such a, a vital part of a lot of the stuff that I do. And Carrie, you touched on so much of it in terms of, first let's like, work our way backwards right i'm in the academic space these days and i had a conversation with some of my students and i was sharing with them that you could be the smartest person in the room but if nobody likes you right if nobody likes you your success will be limited and very quickly and i think that that does speak to 
some indications of of the whole idea of the reputation, right? Because it's not just about, I think it's important, right? Like you have to be of good ethical standard, right? But even if you are and you annoy people, <laughs> you're not going to stay in the room that long. And I know it sounds bizarre, but like when you're going through a lot of these exercises with, with folks, they don't always get that. So I appreciate you calling that out for, for us. But my question is that when you think about emotional intelligence and how it plays into these uh, into this sales element, where have you where do you guide the folks on as a part of your team towards being able to execute that? How do you help your sales folks drive those best practices with emotional intelligence to help execute the sale? So I talk with my team. So we talk about buying styles a lot, right? We send people to Miller Hyman, we send them to spin selling, right? And we talk about buying styles, right? Your quadrant of buyers. We do not quite as good a job of talking about selling styles. My observation, and this is just for years of observation, is that you are going to win or lose in the first 30 seconds of your sale. We get paid to walk in, survey the landscape, not say the wrong thing, to the customer and figure out what their buying style is in 30 seconds or less. It takes really smart, emotionally intelligent people to figure that out. Those are your best salespeople. I talk about being a chameleon. And once you figure out what your customer's buying style is, figuring out what your selling style should be for that person. And I'm going to do you one better here in my space. And that is that there is a subset of the population that is really good at being highly focused and in the weeds. And in everyday vernacular, we talk about them being on the spectrum. In science, we have probably more customers on the spectrum than you would consider, that you would really think about in the general population. Neil deGrasse Tyson actually was asked a question by a young woman who was on the spectrum about being a scientist and being autistic. And he answered just beautifully. And he said, think about it. They make amazing scientists. They can focus for long periods of time on highly complex things, right? So you walk into your customer site, you got to talk to this person and they struggle to look at you. It's hard as an extroverted kind of salesperson to stop, see that, step back and go, okay, now how do I do this? And it's not easy. You have to stop being who you are at some level to meet that person where they live. I think that this is also a great call out for what you're describing is neurodiversity. In, in a past episode, Jim actually touched on this with other guests, but this is a, that's an excellent call out about neurodiversity. One, recognizing someone that is, that is exhibiting this. I mean, we all have it, right? We all classify as someone who is neurodiverse. But what happens is that culturally, we tend to gravitate towards the center, right? And so those that may not necessarily be toward that emotional intelligence allows for you to have the ability to communicate and why you need that exposure, right, in terms of neurodiversity so that when you are in a sales situation that you have the ability to do exactly what you said is to adapt to really to connect more so than anything else. But then ultimately that connection leads to that, at least the opening the door for the potential for the sale. I think it's critical that you know your own biases as well. Yes. You must know your own biases. Uh, Honestly, my bias is people with really thick Southern accents. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. But when I hear like a really heavy Louisiana accent, I think alligators and bayous. And I know some incredibly brilliant scientists. But when I first met him, I was like, who is this guy? There is an amazing scientist. Uh, again, speaking of six degrees of Harold McNair, he, there's an amazing scientist that I know that actually came out of his laboratory. And I believe he went to Virginia Tech on a fall scholarship. And he's a PhD in analytical chemistry. He's probably six foot five. He's a really big dude. And he looks like a football player. He's a brilliant scientist. He's not what you would expect when you walk in the door and start talking to a scientist. So you might actually be inclined to talk to the person next to him. So you have to be really careful about your own personal biases and figuring out who the important people are in the room 
and being careful not to talk to the man that's sitting next to the woman that is actually in charge. So that's critical. It's interesting that you reference checking your own biases or at least being aware of your biases and responding accordingly to that. We had a, a guest on an earlier episode who's got this great personal story. A single mom for 14 years was on public assistance for a period of time, and then she's risen the ranks to become a VP of IT at a sizable organization, Molson Coors. And she's got this great story. And one of the things that came out of that conversation, one of the things that came out of the conversation is that from her position and all of the things that she's learned, one of the things that she's bothered by is that people don't approach her to engage in a conversation about how she navigated these things. And the takeaway for me in that conversation is that our biases, if we don't, if, if we don't recognize them, there's so much learning that we miss out on because we believe the world in, is some sort of way or this person is some sort of way because of some odd belief that we have. That's a great call out too, as, as a practitioner as an, as, and as a leader. You know, it ties back to what you said. You have to be in the moment, present, and be able to meet people where they are for you to have the kind of success that you want to achieve and for you to actually connect at a personal level with whoever's sitting across from you. So we've talked about mapping out the stakeholder la landscape. We've talked about understanding the political, the economic, and, and, the, uh, and the buyer landscape. We've talked about a lot of stuff and there's so many takeaways here. How do you navigate somebody who's your adversary in a, comp a complex deal cycle? So particularly with complex sales, these are sales where you're having multiple touch points with individuals in an organization. So you should regularly check, right? With check in with those individuals. And the questions that you're asking are critical. We've been talking about this for a couple of weeks. We're talking about bringing in the committee. You know, how, let me just take your temperature. How are people feeling in your organization about this project, about the vendors that are involved, about how things are being handled, about me, about the technology, and then just be quiet and sit back and let them be quiet, sit back and let them speak is huge. And just, oh, that's interesting. Tell me a little more about that. Who's that individual? Have they used somebody else's stuff in the past? What's been their experience? My, and the other thing, so that's one approach, kind of soft approach. There's also the very direct approach. And if you, and again, knowing who your audience is, there's the direct approach that you use because the person you're dealing with is pretty direct. And then there's the direct approach that you use because at this point, there's literally nothing to lose. What are they going to do? Buy less from you? My favorite story is I had a customer, there, there was a technology I was selling at one time was the only technology for what they wanted to do was hands down the best, by far the most sensitive, really the only solution for what this customer wanted to do. And the customer said to me, Carrie, my boss won't let me buy it because he hates your company. And I went, do you know why? And they said, we have no idea why. He just said, we will never buy anything from them ever. I never met the man. I called him. I left the message. I said, Mr. Manager, Priyanka says that she will, that she is not able to purchase this instrument for her challenge because you don't like me. <laughs> he called me the next day. He said, I didn't say I didn't like you. I didn't like your company. Okay. Well, tell me all about that. And eventually they bought from us. So you can be direct simply because you don't have anything to lose. And if you don't ask that question, then that's sales malpractice. If you're, if you don't ask a question because you're afraid to ask a question, then you deserve to lose. And you can ask direct questions with individuals who are direct, or you can take a soft approach. There's a variety of ways to do it. Yeah. I think that that's, you touched on so many things, right? So you have to have the courage to be willing to do that. And I know you say you have nothing to lose, but there are still people who will have nothing to lose and still not ask that question. We've covered a, a lot of ground today. If you had two or three key takeaways that you wanted to leave with our listeners, what would those be? I would say a couple of things. First, people buy from people and emotional intelligence is critical with regard to understanding your customer, whether you like them or they like you, but focusing on the challenge that they have, whatever that challenge is, 
to make sure that they know that regardless of whatever is going on and whoever is involved, that you are committed to helping them solve their challenge. And that's your goal and to do it with integrity and to, again, not put the sale in front of the solution because particularly in the technical space, in the end, it's almost the only thing you have as a salesperson is your integrity. It, I find it very frustrating the perception that salespeople are somehow less than the scientists themselves. We provide value to our customers every day. We provide them information that they would not have been able to find otherwise. We help connect the dots every day to help them solve a problem. And if you focus on that, then everything else falls into place. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think that, and I love how you're plugging EQ because I'm just an EQ geek, so I appreciate that. But I think that as you talk about the whole idea of the integrity piece and EQ, they're, they're all really one and the same, right? That there is a there is a, a desire to sometimes want to achieve the goal and compromise. And especially when you talk about, like with technical sales, it being a very small world. And quite frankly, Jim had mentioned this earlier, like the whole idea of six degrees of separation just in general puts us in a place where it is important for us to have a high level of integrity and exercise high EQ. Carrie, we are so appreciative to have had you on the show. I do encourage everyone that is listening to connect with her on LinkedIn. I surely, if you're in the technical space or have questions just in general about sales, I think she's definitely a go-to person that you want to reach out to and, and seek. You will be able to hear both episodes of, of Carrie's expertise and genius on the Cascading Leadership Podcast. You can find us on our social media platforms, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, and YouTube. We're still waiting for Jim to get that dance move ready for us. So stay tuned for that. Thank you so much. See you next time, everybody. Thank you.